Chapter Thirteen of the Pirate's Own Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Peebles. The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms. Chapter Thirteen. Authentic History of the Malay Pirates of the Indian Ocean, with a narrative of the expedition against the inhabitants of Kuala Batu commanded by Commodore Downs. A glance at the map of the East India Islands will convince us that this region of the globe must, from its natural configuration and locality, be peculiarly liable to become the seat of piracy. These islands form an immense cluster, lying as if it were in the high road which connects the commercial nations of Europe and Asia with each other, affording a hundred fastnesses from which to waylay the traveler. A large proportion of the population is at the same time confined to the coasts or the estuaries of rivers. They are fishermen and mariners, they are barbarous and poor, therefore rapacious, faithless, and sanguinary. These are circumstances, it must be confessed, which militate strongly to beget a piratical character. It is not surprising, then, that the Malay should have been notorious for their depredations from our first acquaintance with them. Among the tribes of the Indian islands, the most noted for their piracies are, of course, the most idle and the least industrious, and particularly such as are unaccustomed to follow agriculture or trade as regular pursuits. The agricultural tribes of Java and many of Sumatra never commit piracy at all, and the most civilized inhabitants of Celebes are very little addicted to this vice. Among the most confirmed pirates are the true Malays, inhabiting the small islands about the eastern extremity of the Straits of Malacca, and those lying between Sumatra and Borneo, down to Billitin and Cavamatir. Still more noted than these are the inhabitants of certain islands situated between Borneo and the Philippines, of whom the most desperate and enterprising are the Sulus and Illanoons the former inhabiting a well-known group of islands of the same name, and the latter being one of the most numerous nations of the great island of Magandondo. The depredations of the proper Malays extend from Junk Ceylon to Java, through its whole coast as far as Grip to Papir and Kriti, in Borneo and the western coast of Celebes. In another direction they infest the coasting trade of the Cochin Chinese and Siamese nations in the Gulf of Siam, finding sail for their booty and shelter for themselves in the ports of Tringham, Kalantan, and Sahang. The most noted piratical stations of these people are the small islands about Lingin and Rio, particularly Galang, Tamiang, and Mafar. The chief of this last has seventy or eighty proas fit to undertake piratical expeditions. The Sulu pirates chiefly confine their depredations to the Philippine Islands, which they have continued to infest with little interruption for nearly three centuries. In open defiance of the Spanish authorities and the numerous establishments maintained to check them. The piracies of the Illanoons, on the contrary, are widely extended, being carried on all the way from their native country to the Spice Islands on one side and to the Straits of Malacca on the other. In these last, indeed, they have formed for the last few years two permanent establishments. One of these situated on Sumatra, near Indragiri, is called Ridi. The other, a small island on the coast of Linga, is named Salangut. Besides those who are avowed pirates, it ought to be particularly noticed that a great number of the Malayan princes must be considered as accessories to their crimes, for they afford them protection, contribute to their outfit, and often share in their booty, so that a piratical proa is too commonly more welcome in their harbors than a fair trader. The Malay piratical proas are from six to eight tons burden, and run from six to eight fathoms in length. They carry from one to two small guns with commonly four swivels or rantakas to each side, and a crew of from twenty to thirty men. When they engage, they put up a strong bulwark of thick plank. The Illanoon proas are much larger and more formidable, and commonly carry from four to six guns and a proportionable number of swivels, and have not unfrequently a double bulwark covered with buffalo hides. Their crews consist of from forty to eighty men, 
Both, of course, are provided with spears, krises, and as many firearms as they can procure. Their modes of attack are cautious and cowardly, for plunder and not fame is their object. They lie concealed under the land until they find a fit object and opportunity. The time chosen is when a vessel runs aground or is becalmed in the interval between the land and sea breezes. A vessel under way is seldom or never attacked. Several of the marauders attack together and station themselves under the bows and quarters of a ship when she has no longer steerage way and is incapable of pointing her guns. The action continues often for several hours doing very little mischief, but when the crews are exhausted with it defense or have expended their ammunition, the pirates take this opportunity of boarding in a mass. This may suggest the best means of defense. A ship, when attacked during a calm, ought, perhaps, rather to stand on the defensive and wait, if possible, the setting in of the sea breeze than attempt any active operations which would only fatigue the crew and disable them from making the necessary defense when boarding is attempted. Boarding netting, pikes, and pistols appear to afford effectual security, and indeed we conceive that a vessel thus defended by resolute crews of Europeans or Americans stand but little danger from any open attack of pirates whatsoever, for their guns are so ill-served that neither the hull or the rigging of a vessel can receive much damage from them however much protracted the contest. The pirates are upon the whole extremely impartial in the selection of their prey, making little choice between natives and strangers, giving always, however, a natural preference to the most timid and the most easily overcome. When an expedition is undertaken by the Malay pirates, they range themselves under the banner of some piratical chief noted for his courage and conduct. The native prince of the place where it is prepared supplies the adventurers with arms, ammunition, and opium, and claims as his share of the plunder the female captives, the cannon, and one-third of all the rest of the booty. In November 1827 a principal chief of pirates named Sindana made a descent upon Mamudgu with forty-five proas, burnt three-fourths of the kampong, driving the rajah with his family among the mountains. Some scores of men were killed and three hundred made prisoners, besides women and children to half that amount. In December following, when I was there, the people were slowly returning from the hills, but had not yet attempted to rebuild the kampong, which lay in ashes. During my stay here, ten weeks, the place was visited by two other piratical chiefs, one of which was from Kaili, the other from Mandar Point under Bem Bowen, who appeared to have charge of the whole. Between them, they had 134 proas of all sizes. Among the most desperate and successful pirates of the present day, Raga is most distinguished. He is dreaded by people of all denominations and universally known as the Prince of Pirates. For more than 17 years this man has carried on a system of piracy to an extent never before known. His expeditions and enterprises would fill a large volume. They have invariably been marked with singular cunning and intelligence, barbarity and reckless inattention to the shedding of human blood. He has emissaries everywhere and has intelligence of the best description. It was about the year 1813 Raga commenced operations on a large scale. In that year he cut off three English vessels, killing the captains with his own hands. So extensive were his depredations about that time that a proclamation was issued from Batavia declaring the east coast of Borneo to be under strict blockade. Two British sloops of war scoured the coast, one of which, the Elk, Captain Reynolds, was attacked during the night by Raga's own proa, who unfortunately was not on board at the time. This proa, which Raga personally commanded, and the loss of which he frequently laments, carried eight guns and was full of his best men. A European vessel was faintly descried about three o'clock one foggy morning. The rain fell in torrents, the time and weather were favorable circumstances for a surprise, and the commander, determined to distinguish himself in the absence of the Raja Raga, gave directions to close, fire the guns, and board. He was the more confident of success as the European vessel was observed to keep away out of the proper course on approaching her. On getting within about a hundred fathoms of the elk, they fired their broadside, gave a loud shout, and with their long oars pulled towards their prey. 
The sound of a drum beating to quarters no sooner struck the ear of the astonished Malays than they endeavored to get away. It was too late. The ports were opened, and a broadside, accompanied by three British cheers, gave sure indications of their fate. The captain hailed the elk and would fain persuade him it was a mistake. It was indeed a mistake, and one not to be rectified by the Malayan explanation. The pro was sunk by repeated broadsides, and the commanding officer refused to pick up any of the people, who with the exception of five were drowned. These, after floating four days on some spars, were picked up by a forgotten proa, and told the story to Raga, who swore a new destruction to every European he should henceforth take. This desperado has for upwards of seventeen years been the terror of the Straits of Makassar, during which period he has committed the most extensive and dreadful excesses, sparing no one. Few respectable families along the coast of Borneo and Celebes but have to complain of the loss of a proa or of some number of their race. He is not more universally dreaded than detested. It is well known that he has cut off and murdered the crews of more than forty European vessels, which have either been wrecked on the coasts or entrusted themselves in native ports. It is his boast that twenty of the commanders have fallen by his hands. The western coast of Celebes, for about two hundred and fifty miles, is absolutely lined with proas, belonging principally to three considerable rajas, who act in conjunction with Raga and other pirates. Their proas may be seen in clusters of from fifty, eighty, and one hundred. At Sediano I counted one hundred and forty-seven laying on the sand at high water mark in parallel rows, and kept in a horizontal position by poles completely ready for the sea. Immediately behind them are the campongs, in which are the crews. Here, likewise, are kept the sails, gunpowder, etc., necessary for their equipment. On the very summits of the mountains, which in many parts rise abruptly from the sea, may be distinguished innumerable huts. Here reside people who are constantly on the lookout. A vessel within ten miles of the shore will not probably perceive a single proa, yet in less than two hours, if the tide be high, she may be surrounded by some hundreds. Should the water be low, they will push off during the night. Signals are made from mountain to mountain along the coast with the utmost rapidity, during the daytime by flags attached to long bamboos, at night by fires. Each chief sends forth his proas, the crews of which, in hazardous cases, are infuriated with opium, when they will most assuredly take the vessel, if she be not better provided than most merchantmen. Mr. Dalton, who went to the Pergotten River in 1830, says, Whilst I remained here there were seventy-one proas of considerable sizes, thirty-nine of which were professed pirates. They were anchored off the point of a small promontory on which the Raja has an establishment and bazaar. The largest of these proas belonged to Raga, who received by the fleet of proas in which I came his regular supplies of arms and ammunition from Singapore. Here nestle the principal pirates, and Raga holds his headquarters. His grand depot was a few miles farther up. Raja Agi Boda himself generally resides some distance up a small river which runs eastward of the point. Near his habitation stands the principal bazaar, which would be a great curiosity for a European to visit if he could only manage to return, which very few have. The Raga gave me a pressing invitation to spend a couple of days at his country house, but all the Bugis's Nakodas strongly dissuaded me from such an attempt. I soon discovered the cause of their apprehension. They were jealous of Agibota, well knowing he would plunder me, and considered every article taken by him was so much lost to the Sultan of Koti, who naturally would expect the people to reserve me for his own particular plucking. When the fact was known of a European having arrived in the Pergotten River, this amiable prince and friend of Europeans, impatient to seize his prey, came immediately to the point from his country house, and sending for the Nakada of the Proa, ordered him to land me and all my goods instantly. An invitation now came for me to go on shore and amuse myself with shooting, and look at some rare birds of beautiful plumage which the Rajah would give me if I would accept of them. But knowing what were his intentions, and being well aware that I should be supported by all the Bugis's pros from Koti, I feigned sickness and requested that the birds might be sent on board. Upon this Agibota, who could no longer restrain himself, 
sent off two boats of armed men who robbed me of many articles and would certainly have forced me on shore or murdered me in the proa had not a signal been made to the bugis's nakadas who immediately came with their people and with spears and krises drove the rajah's people overboard the nakadas nine in number now went on shore when a scene of contention took place showing clearly the character of this chief the bugis from koti explained that with regard to me it was necessary to be particularly circumspect as i was not only well known in singapore but the authorities in that settlement knew that i was on board the sultan's proa and they themselves were responsible for my safety to this circumstance alone i owe my life on several occasions as in the event of anything happening to me every nakada was apprehensive of his proa being seized on his return to singapore i was therefore more peculiarly cared for by this class of men and they are powerful the rajah answered the nakadas by saying i might be disposed of as many others had been and no further notice taken of the circumstance he himself would write to singapore that i had been taken by an alligator or bitten by a snake whilst out shooting and as for what property i might have in the proa he would divide it with the sultan of koti the bugis however refused to listen to any terms knowing the sultan of koti would call him to an account for the property and the authorities of singapore for my life our proa with others therefore dropped about four miles down the river where we took in fresh water here we remained six days every argument being in vain to entice me on shore at length the bugis's nakadas came to the determination to sail without passes which brought the rajah to terms the proas returned to the point and i was given to understand i might go on shore in safety i did so and was introduced to the rajah whom i found under a shed with about one hundred and fifty of his people they were busy gambling and had the appearance of what they really are a ferocious set of banditti agi bota is a good-looking man about forty years of age of no education whatever he divides his time between gaming opium and cock-fighting that is in the interval of his more serious and profitable employment piracy and rapine he asked me to produce what money i had about me on seeing only ten rupees he remarked that it was not worth while to win so small a sum but that if i would fight cocks with him he would lend me as much money as i wanted and added it was beneath his dignity to fight under fifty reals a battle on my saying it was contrary to an englishman's religion to bet wagers he dismissed me immediately after the two rajas produced their cocks and commenced fighting for one rupee aside i was now obliged to give the old bodair five rupees to take some care of me as whilst walking about the people not only thrust their hands into my pockets but pulled the buttons from my clothes whilst sauntering behind the rajah's campong i caught sight of a european woman who on perceiving herself observed instantly ran into one of the houses no doubt dreading the consequences of being recognized there are now in the house of agibota two european women up the country there are others besides several men the bugis inimical to the rajah made no secret of the fact i had heard of it on board the proa and some person in the bazaar confirmed the statement on my arrival strict orders had been given to the inhabitants to put all european articles out of sight one of my servants going into the bazaar brought me such accounts as induced me to visit it in one house were the following articles four bibles one in english one in dutch and two in the portuguese languages many articles of wearing apparel such as jackets and trousers with the buttons altered to suit the natives pieces of shirts tagged to other parts of dress several broken instruments such as quadrants spy-glasses two binnacles with pieces of ship sails bolts and hoops a considerable variety of gunners and carpenters tools stores etc in another shop were two pelisses of faded lilac color these were of modern cut and fashionably made on inquiring how they became possessed of these articles i was told they were some wrecks of european vessels on which no people were found whilst others made no scruple of averring that they were formerly the property of people who had died in the country all the goods in the bazaar belonged to the rajah and were sold on his account large quantities were said to be in his house up the river but on all hands it was admitted raga and his followers had by far the largest part of what was taken 
A mandoor, or head of one of the campongs, showed me some women's stockings, several of which were marked with the letters S.W., also two chemises, one with the letters S.W., two flannel petticoats, a miniature portrait frame, the picture was in the Rajah's house, with many articles of dress of both sexes. In consequence of the strict orders given on the subject, I could see no more. Indeed, there were both difficulty and danger attending these inquiries. I particularly wanted to obtain the miniature picture and offered the mandor fifty rupees if he could procure it. He laughed at me, and pointing significantly to his kris, drew one hand across my throat and then across his own, giving me to understand such would be the result to us both on such an application to the Rajah. It is the universal custom of the pirates on this coast to sell the people for slaves immediately on their arrival, the Rajah taking for himself a few of the most useful and receiving a percentage upon the purchase money of the remainder, with a moiety of the vessel and every article on board. European vessels are taken up the river where they are immediately broken up. The situation of European prisoners is indeed dreadful in a climate like this, where even the labor of natives is intolerable. They are compelled to bear all the drudgery and allowed a bare sufficiency of rice and salt to eat. It is utterly impossible for Europeans who have seen these pirates at such places as Singapore and Batavia to form any conception of their true character. There they are under immediate control, and every part of their behavior is a tissue of falsehood and deception. They constantly carry about with them a smooth tongue, cringing demeanor, a complying disposition which always asserts and never contradicts, a countenance which appears to anticipate the very wish of the Europeans, and which so generally imposes upon his understanding that he at once concludes them to be the best and gentlest of human beings. But let the European meet them in any of their own campongs, and a very different character they will appear. The character and treacherous proceeding narrated above, and the manner of cutting off vessels and butchering their crews, apply equally to all the pirates of the East India Islands, by which many hundred European and American vessels have been surprised and their crews butchered. On the 7th of February, 1831, the ship Friendship, Captain Endicott of Salem, Massachusetts, was captured by the Malays while lying at Kuala Batu on the coast of Sumatra. In the forenoon of the fatal day, Captain Endicott, Mr. Barry, second mate, and four of the crew, it seems, went on shore as usual for the purpose of weighing pepper, expecting to obtain that day two boatloads which had been promised them by the Malays. After the first boat was loaded, they observed that she delayed some time in passing down the river, and her crew, being composed of Malays, was supposed by the officers to be stealing pepper from her and secreting it in the bushes. In consequence of this conjecture, two men were sent off to watch them, who on approaching the boat saw five or six Malays leap from the jungle and hurry on board of her. The former, however, supposed them to be the boat's crew, as they had seen an equal number quit her previous to their own approach. In this they were mistaken, as will subsequently appear. At this time a brig hove in sight and was seen standing towards Susu, another pepper port, distant about five miles. Captain Endicott, on going to the beach to ascertain whether the brig had hoisted any colors, discovered that the boat with pepper had approached within a few yards of the friendship manned with an unusual number of natives. It appears that when the pepper boats came alongside of the friendship, as but few of the hands could work at a time, numbers of the Malays came on board, and on being questioned by Mr. Knight, the first officer who was in the gangway taking an account of the pepper, as to their business, their reply was that they had come to see the vessel. Mr. Knight ordered them into their boat again, and some of them obeyed, but only to return immediately to assist in the work of death, which was now commenced by attacking Mr. Knight and the rest of the crew on board. The crew of the vessel being so scattered, it was impossible to concentrate their force so as to make a successful resistance. Some fell on the forecastle, one in the gangway, and Mr. Knight fell upon the quarter-deck severely wounded by a stab in the back while in the act of snatching from the bulwarks a boarding pike with which to defend himself. 
the two men who were taking the pepper on a stage having vainly attempted to get on board to the assistance of their comrades were compelled to leap into the sea one of them charles converse of salem being severely wounded succeeded in swimming to the bobstays to which he clung until taken on board by the natives and from some cause he was not afterwards molested his companion john davis being unable to swim drifted with the tide near the boat tackle or davit falls the blocks being overhauled down near the water one of these he laid hold of which the malays perceiving dropped their boat astern and dispatched him the cook sprang into a canoe alongside and in attempting to push off she was capsized and being unable to swim he got on the bottom and paddled ashore with his hands where he was made prisoner gregory an italian sought shelter in the foretop gallant cross trees where he was fired at several times by the melees with the muskets of the friendship which were always kept loaded and ready for use while on the coast three of the crew leaped into the sea and swam to a point of land near a mile distant to the northward of the town and unperceived by the melees on shore pursued their course to the northward towards cape felix intending to go to the port of annalabu about forty-five miles distant having walked all night they found themselves on the following morning near the promontory and still twenty-five miles distant from annalabu when mr endicott mr barry and the four seamen arrived at the beach they saw the crew jumping into the sea the truth now with all its horrors flashed upon his mind that the vessel was attacked and in an instant they jumped on board the boat and pushed off at the same time a friendly raja named poe adam sprang into the boat he was the proprietor of a port and considerable property at a place called pulokio but three miles distant from the mouth of the river kuala batu more business had been done by the rajah during the eight years past than by any other on the pepper coast he had uniformly professed himself friendly to the americans and he has generally received the character of their being honest speaking a little english as he sprang into the boat he exclaimed captain you got trouble malay kill you he kill po adam too crowds of malays assembled on both sides of the river brandishing their weapons in a menacing manner while a ferry-boat manned with eight or ten of the natives armed with spears and krises pushed off to prevent the officers regaining their ship the latter exhibited no fear and flourished the cutlass of poe adam in a menacing manner from the bows of the boat it so intimidated the malays that they fled to the shore leaving a free passage to the ship but as they got near her they found that the malays had got entire possession of her some of them were promenading the deck others were making signals of success to the people on shore while with the exception of one man aloft not an individual of the crew could be seen three malay boats with about fifty men now issued from the river in the direction of the ship while the captain and his men concluding that their only hope of recovering their vessel was to obtain assistance from some other ships directed their course towards muchi where they knew that several american vessels were lying at anchor three american captains upon hearing the misfortunes of their countrymen weighed anchor immediately for kuala batu determined if possible to recover the ship by four o'clock on the same day they gained an anchorage off that place the malays in the meantime had removed on shore every movable article belonging to the ship including specie besides several cases of opium amounting in all to upwards of thirty thousand dollars this was done on the night of the ninth and on the morning of the tenth they contrived to heave in the chain cable and get the anchor up to the bows and the ship was drifting finely towards the beach when the cable not being stopped abaft the bits began suddenly to run out with great velocity but a bite having by accident been thrown forward of the windlass a riding turn was the consequence and the anchor in its descent was suddenly checked about fifteen fathoms from the house a squall soon after coming on the vessel drifted obliquely towards the shore and grounded upon a coral reef near half a mile to the southward of the town the next day having obtained a convenient anchorage a message was sent by a friendly malay who came on board at susu demanding the restoration of the ship the rajah replied that he would not give her up but that they were welcome to take her if they could a fire was now opened upon the friendship by the vessels 
Her decks were crowded with Malays who promptly returned the fire, as did also the forts on shore. This mode of warfare appeared undecisive, and it was determined to decide the contest by a close action. A number of boats being manned and armed with about thirty officers and men, a movement was made to carry the ship by boarding. The Malays did not wait the approach of this determined attack, but all deserted the vessel to her lawful owners when she was taken possession of and warped out into deep water. The appearance of the ship at the time she was boarded beggars all description. Every part of her bore ample testimony to the scene of violence and destruction with which she had been visited. The objects of the voyage were abandoned, and the friendship returned to the United States. The public were unanimous in calling for a redress of the unparalleled outrage on the lives and property of citizens of the United States. The government immediately adopted measures to punish so outrageous an act of piracy by dispatching the frigate Potomac, Commodore Downs commander. The Potomac sailed from New York the 24th of August, 1831. After touching at Rio Janeiro and the Cape of Good Hope, she anchored off Kuala Batu in February 1832, disguised as a Danish ship, and came to in merchantman style, a few men being sent aloft, dressed in red and blue flannel shirts, and one sail being clued up and furled at a time. A reconnoitering party were sent on shore disguised as pepper dealers, but they returned without being able to ascertain the situations of the forts. The ship now presented a busy scene. It was determined to commence an attack upon the town the next morning, and every necessary preparation was accordingly made. Muskets were cleaned, cartridge boxes buckled on, cutlasses examined and put in order, etc. At twelve o'clock at night all hands were called. Those assigned to take part in the expedition were mustered, when Lieutenant Shubrick, the commander of the detachment, gave them special orders. When they entered the boats and proceeded to the shore, where they effected a landing near the dawn of day, amid a heavy surf, about a mile and a half to the north of the town, undiscovered by the enemy, and without any serious accident having befallen them, though several of the party were thoroughly drenched by the beating of the surf, and some of their ammunition was injured. The troops then formed and took up their line of march against the enemy, over a beach of deep and heavy sand. They had not proceeded far before they were discovered by a native at a distance, who ran at full speed to give the alarm. A rapid march soon brought them up with the first fort, when a division of men under the command of Lieutenant Hoff was detached from the main body and ordered to surround it. The first fort was found difficult of access, in consequence of a deep hedge of thorn bushes and brambles with which it was environed. The assault was commenced by the pioneers with their crows and axes, breaking down the gates and forcing a passage. This was attended with some difficulty and gave the enemy time for preparation. They raised their war whoop and resisted most manfully, fighting with spears, sabers, and muskets. They had also a few brass pieces in the fort, but they managed them with so little skill as to produce no effect, for the balls uniformly whizzed over the heads of our men. The resistance of the Malays was in vain, the fort was stormed, and soon carried, not, however, till almost every individual in it was slain. Po Mahomet, a chief of much distinction, and who was one of the principal persons concerned in the outrage on the friendship, was here slain. The mother of Chedula, another Raja, was also slain here. Another woman fell at this port, but her rank was not ascertained. She fought with the spirit of a desperado. A seaman had just scaled one of the ramparts when he was severely wounded by a blow received from a weapon in her hands, but her life paid the forfeit of her daring, for she was immediately transfixed by a bayonet in the hands of the person whom she had so severely injured. His head was wounded by a javelin, his thumb nearly cut off by a saber, and a ball was shot through his hat. Lieutenants Edson and Ferret proceeded to the rear of the town and made a bold attack upon that fort which, after a spirited resistance on the part of the Malays, surrendered. Both officers and marines here narrowly escaped with their lives. One of the natives in the fort had trained his piece in such a manner as to rake their whole body when he was shot down by a marine while in the very act of applying a match to it. The cannon was afterwards found to have been filled with bullets. 
This fort, like the former, was environed with thick jungle, and great difficulty had been experienced in entering it. The engagement had now become general, and the alarm universal. Men, women, and children were seen flying in every direction, carrying the few articles they were able to seize in the moments of peril, and some of the men were cut down in the flight. Several of the enemy's proas, filled with people, were severely raked by a brisk fire from the six-pounder as they were sailing up the river to the south of the town, and numbers of the natives were killed. The third and most formidable fort was now attacked, and it proved the most formidable, and the cooperation of the several divisions was required for its reduction, but so spirited was the fire poured into it that it was soon obliged to yield, and the next moment the American colors were seen triumphantly waving over its battlements. The greater part of the town was reduced to ashes. The bazaar, the principal place of merchandise, and most of the private dwellings were consumed by fire. The triumph had now been completed over the melees. Ample satisfaction had been taken for their outrages committed upon our own countrymen, and the bugle sounded the return of the ship's forces, and the embarkation was soon after effected. The action had continued about two hours and a half, and was gallantly sustained both by officers and men from its commencement to its close. The loss on the part of the Meles was near a hundred killed, while of the Americans only two lost their lives. Among the spoils were a Chinese gong, a Koran taken at Mohammed's fort, and several pieces of rich gold cloth. Many of the men came off richly laden with spoils which they had taken from the enemy, such as rajah's scarfs, gold and silver tunam boxes, chains, earrings and finger rings, anklets and bracelets, and a variety of shawls, chrises richly hilted and with gold scabbards, and a variety of other ornaments. Money to a considerable amount was brought off. That nothing should be left undone to have an indelible impression on the minds of these people of the power of the United States to inflict punishment for aggressions committed on her commerce in seas however distant, the ship was got under way the following morning, and brought to with a spring on her cable within less than a mile of the shore, when the larboard side was brought to bear nearly upon the site of the town. The object of the Commodore in this movement was not to open an indiscriminate or destructive fire upon the town and inhabitants of Kuala Batu, but to show them the irresistible power of thirty-two pound shot, and to reduce the fort of Tuca de Lama, which could not be reached on account of the jungle and stream of water on the morning before, and from which a fire had been opened and continued during the embarkation of the troops on their return to the ship. The fort was very soon deserted, while the shot was cutting it to pieces, and tearing up whole cocoa trees by the roots. In the afternoon a boat came off from the shore, bearing a flag of truce to the Commodore, beseeching him in all the practiced forms of submission of the East, that he would grant them peace, and cease to fire his big guns. Hostilities now ceased, and the Commodore informed them that the objects of his government in sending him to their shores had now been consummated in the punishment of the guilty, who had committed their piracies on the friendship. Thus ended the intercourse with Kuala Batu. The Potomac proceeded from this place to China, and from thence to the Pacific Ocean. After looking to the interests of the American commerce in those parts, she arrived at Boston in 1834, after a three years' absence. End of chapter 13 of The Pirate's Own Book Recording by Joelle Peebles Fourteen of The Pirate's Own Book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms. Chapter 14. The Adventures of Captain Condent. Captain Condent was a Plymouth-born man, but we are as yet ignorant of the motives and time of his first turning pirate. He was one of those who thought fit to retire from Providence, on Governor Rogers' arrival at that island, in a sloop belonging to Mr. Simpson of New York, a Jew merchant, of which sloop he was then quartermaster. Soon after they left the island, an accident happened on board, which put the whole crew into consternation. They had among them an Indian man, whom some of them had beaten. In revenge he got most of the arms forward into the hold, and designed to blow up the sloop, 
upon which some advised scuttling the deck and throwing grenade shells down but condent said that was too tedious and dangerous since the fellow might fire through the deck and kill several of them he therefore taking a pistol in one hand and his cutlass in the other leaped into the hold the indian discharged a piece at him which broke his arm but however he ran up and shot the indian when he was dead the crew hacked him to pieces and the gunner ripping up his belly and tearing out his heart broiled and ate it after this they took a merchantman called the duke of york and some disputes arising among the pirates the captain and one half of the company went on board the prize the other half who continued in the sloop chose condent captain he shaped his course for the cape de verde islands and in his way took a merchant ship from madeira laden with wine and bound for the west indies which he plundered and let go then coming to the isle of may one of the said islands he took the whole salt fleet consisting of about twenty sail wanting a boom he took out the mainmast of one of these ships to supply the want here he took upon himself the administration of justice inquiring into the manner of the commander's behavior to their men and those against whom the complaint was made he whipped and pickled he took what provision and other necessaries he wanted and having augmented his company by volunteers and forced men he left the ships and sailed to St. Jago, where he took a Dutch ship, which had formerly been a privateer. This proved also an easy prize, for he fired but one broadside, and clapping her on board, carried her without resistance, for the captain and several men were killed, and some wounded by his great shot. The ship proving for his purpose, he gave her the name of the Flying Dragon, went on board with his crew, and made a present of his sloop to a mate of an English prize, whom he had forced with him. From hence he stood away from the coast of Brazil, and in his cruise took several Portuguese ships, which he plundered and let go. After these he fell in with a right galley, Captain John Spelt, commander, hired by the South Sea Company, to go to the coast of Angola for slaves, and thence to Buenos Aires. This ship he detained a considerable time, and the captain being his townsman, treated him very civilly. A few days after he took Spelt, he made prize of a Portuguese, laden with bale goods and stores. He rigged the right galley anew, and put on board of her some of the goods. Soon after he had discharged the Portuguese, he met with a Dutch East Indiaman of twenty-eight guns, whose captain was killed the first broadside, and took her with little resistance, for he had hoisted the pirate's colors on board Spelt's ship. He now, with three sail, steered for the islands of Ferdinando, where he hove down and cleaned the flying dragon. Having careened, he put eleven Dutchmen on board Captain Spelt, to make amends for the hands he had forced from him, and sent him away, making him a present of the goods he had taken from the Portuguese ship. When he sailed himself, he ordered the Dutch to stay at Ferdinando twenty-four hours after his departure, threatening, if he did not comply, to sink his ship, if he fell a second time into his hands, and to put all the company to the sword. He then stood for the coast of Brazil, where he met a Portuguese man-of-war of seventy guns, which he came up with. The Portuguese hailed him, and he answered, From London, bound to Buenos Aires. The Portuguese manned his shrouds and cheered him, when Condent fired a broadside, and a spart engagement ensued for the space of three glasses, but Condent, finding himself overmatched, made the best of his way, and being the best sailor, got off. A few days after, he took a vessel of the same nation, who gave an account that he had killed above forty men in the Guarda del Costa, beside a number wounded. He kept along the coast to the southward, and took a French ship of eighteen guns, laden with wine and brandy, bound for the South Sea, which he carried with him into the river of Platte. He sent some of his men ashore to kill some wild cattle, but they were taken by the crew of a Spanish man-of-war. On their examination before the captain, they said they were two guinea ships, with slaves belonging to the South Sea Company, and on this story were allowed to return to their boats. Here five of his forced men ran away with his canoe, he plundered the French ship, cut her adrift, and she was stranded. He proceeded along the Brazil coast, and hearing a pirate ship was lost upon it, and the pirates imprisoned, he used all the Portuguese who fell into his hands, who were many, very barbarously, cutting off their ears and noses. And as his master was a papist, when they took a priest, they made him say mass at the mainmast, and would afterwards get on his back and ride him about the decks, or else load and drive him like a beast. He from this went to the Guinea coast, and took Captain Hill in the Indian Queen. In Luengo Bay he saw two ships at anchor, one a Dutchman of forty-four guns, the other an English ship called the Fame, Captain Bowen commander. They both cut and ran ashore. The Fame was lost, but the Dutch ship the pirate got off and took with him. When he was at sea again, he discharged Captain Hill, 
and stood away for the East Indies. Near the Cape he took an Ostend East Indiaman, of which Mr. Nash, a noted merchant of London, was supercargo. Soon after he took a Dutch East Indiaman, discharged the Ostender, and made for Madagascar. At the Isle of St. Mary he met with some of Captain Halsey's crew, whom he took on board with other stragglers, and shaped his course for the East Indies, and in the way, at the Isle of Johanna, took, in company with two other pirates he met at St. Mary's, the Cassandra East Indiaman, commanded by Captain James McRae. He continued his course for the East Indies, where he made a very great booty, and returning, touched at the island of Mascarenes, where he met with a Portuguese ship of seventy guns, with the Viceroy of Goa on board. This ship he made prize of, and hearing she had money on board, they would allow of no ransom, but carried her to the coast of Zanguebar, where was a Dutch fortification, which they took and plundered, raised the fort, and carried off several men voluntarily. From hence they stood for St. Mary's, where they shared their booty, broke up their company, and settled among the natives. Here a snow came from Bristol, which they obliged to carry a petition to the governor of Mascarenas for a pardon, though they paid the master very generously. The governor returned answer he would take them into protection if they would destroy their ships, which they agreed to, and accordingly sunk the flying dragon and company. Condent and some others went to Mascarenas, where Condent married the governor's sister-in-law, and remained some time. But, as I have been credibly informed, he has since come to France, settled at St. Malo's, and drives a considerable trade as a merchant. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of the Pirate's Own Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Chernick. The Pirate's Own Book by Charles Elms. Chapter fifteen. The Life of Captain Edward Lowe. This ferocious villain was born in Westminster and received an education similar to that of the common people in England. He was by nature a pirate, for even when very young he raised contributions among the boys of Westminster, and if they declined compliance, a battle was the result. When he advanced a step farther in life, he began to exert his ingenuity at low games, and cheating all in his power, and those who pretended to maintain their own right he was ready to call to the field of combat. He went to sea in company with his brother, and continued with him for three or four years. Going over to America, he wrought in a rigging house at Boston for some time. He then came home to see his mother in England, returned to Boston, and continued for some years longer at the same business. But being of a quarrelsome temper, he differed with his master, and went on board a sloop bound for the Bay of Honduras. While there, he had the command of a boat employed in bringing logwood to the ship. In that boat there were twelve men, well armed, to be prepared for the Spaniards, from whom the wood was taken by force. It happened one day that the boat came to the ship just a little before dinner was ready, and Lowe desired that they might dine before they returned. The captain, however, ordered them a bottle of rum, and requested them to take another trip, as no time was to be lost. The crew were enraged, particularly Lowe, who took up a loaded musket, and fired at the captain. But missing him, another man was shot, and they ran off with the boat. The next day they took a small vessel, went on board her, hoisted a black flag, and declared war with the whole world. In their rovings, Lowe met with Lowther, who proposed that he should join him and thus promote their mutual advantage. Having captured a brigantine, Lowe, with forty more, went on board her, and leaving Lowther, they went to seek their own fortune. Their first adventure was the capture of a vessel belonging to Amboy, out of which they took the provisions and allowed her to proceed. On the same day they took a sloop, plundered her, and permitted her to depart. The sloop went into Black Island, and sent intelligence to the governor that Lowe was on the coast. Two small vessels were immediately fitted out, but before their arrival Lowe was beyond their reach. After this narrow escape, Lowe went into port to procure water and fresh provisions, and then renewed his search of plunder. 
he next sailed into the harbour of Port Rosemary, where were thirteen ships, but none of them of any great strength. Lowe hoisted the black flag, assuring them that if they made any resistance they should have no quarter, and manning their boat, the pirates took possession of every one of them, which they plundered and converted to their own use. They then put on board a schooner, ten guns, and fifty men, named her the Fancy, and Lowe himself went on board of her, while Charles Harris was constituted captain of the brigantine. They also constrained a few of the men to join them, and sign their articles. After an unsuccessful pursuit of two sloops from Boston, they steered for the Leeward Islands, but in their way were overtaken by a terrible hurricane. The search for plunder gave place to the most vigorous exertion to save themselves. On board the brigantine all hands were at work, both day and night. They were under the necessity of throwing overboard six of her guns, and all the weighty provisions. In the storm the two vessels were separated, and it was some time before they again saw each other. After the storm, Lowe went into a small island west of the Caribbees, refitted his vessels, and got provision for them in exchange of goods. As soon as the brigantine was ready for sea, they went on a cruise until the fancy should be prepared and during that cruise met with a vessel which had lost all her masts in the storm, which they plundered of goods to the value of one thousand pounds, and returned to the island. When the fancy was ready to sail, a council was held what course they should next steer. They followed the advice of the captain, who thought it not safe to cruise any longer to the leeward, lest they should fall in with any of the men of war that cruised upon that coast, so they sailed for the Azores. The good fortune of Lowe was now singular. In his way thither he captured a French ship of thirty-four guns, and carried her along with him. Then entering St. Michael's Roads, he captured seven sail, threatening with instant death all who dared to oppose him. Thus, by inspiring terror, without firing a single gun, he became master of all that property. Being in want of water and fresh provisions, Lowe sent to the governor demanding a supply, upon condition of releasing the ships he had taken, otherwise he would commit them to the flames. The request was instantly complied with, and six of the vessels were restored. But, a French vessel being among them, they emptied her of guns and all her men except the cook, who, they said, being a greasy fellow, would fry well. They accordingly bound the unfortunate man to the mast, and set the ship on fire. The next who fell in their way was Captain Carter, in the right galley, who, because he showed some inclination to defend himself, was cut and mangled in a barbarous manner. There were also two Portuguese friars, whom they tied to the foremast, and several times let them down before they were dead, merely to gratify their own ferocious dispositions. Meanwhile another Portuguese, beholding this cruel scene, expressed some sorrow in his countenance, upon which one of the wretches said he did not like his looks, and so giving him a stroke across the body with his cutlass, he fell upon the spot. Another of the miscreants, aiming a blow at a prisoner, missed his aim, and struck Lowe upon the under jaw. The surgeon was called, and stitched up the wound, but Lowe finding fault with the operation, the surgeon gave him a blow which broke all the stitches, and left him to sew them himself. After he had plundered this vessel, some of them were for burning her, as they had done the Frenchmen, but instead of that, they cut her cables, rigging, and sails to pieces, and sent her adrift to the mercy of the waves. They next sailed for the island of Madeira, and took up a fishing boat with two old men and a boy. They detained one of them, and sent the other on shore with a flag of truce, requesting the governor to send them a boat of water, else they would hang the other man at the yard-arm. The water was sent, and the man dismissed. They next sailed for the Canary Islands, and there took several vessels, and being informed that two small galleys were daily expected, the sloop was manned and sent in quest of them. They, however, missing their prey, and being great in want of provision, went into St. Michael's in the character of traitors, and being discovered, were apprehended, and the whole crew conducted to the castle, and treated according to their merits. Meanwhile, Lowe's ship was overset upon the careen and lost, so that, having only the fancy schooner remaining, they all, to the number of a hundred, went on board her, and set sail in search of new spoils. They soon met a rich Portuguese vessel, and after some resistance, captured her. Lowe tortured the men to constrain them to inform him where they had hid her treasures. He accordingly discovered that, during the chase, the captain had hung a bag with eleven thousand moadors out of the cabin window, and that, when they were taken, he had cut the rope 
and allowed it to fall into the sea. Upon this intelligence, Lo raved and stormed like a fury, ordered the captain's lips to be cut off and broiled before his eyes, then murdered him and all his crew. After this bloody action, the miscreants steered northward, and in their course seized several vessels, one of which they burned, and plundering the rest allowed them to proceed. Having cleaned in one of the islands, they then sailed for the Bay of Honduras. They met a Spaniard coming out of the bay, which had captured five Englishmen and a pink, plundered them, and brought away the master's prisoners. Low hoisted Spanish colors, but, when he came near, hung out the black flag, and the Spaniard was seized without resistance. Upon finding the masters of the English vessels in the hold, and seeing English goods on board, a consultation was held, when it was determined to put all the Spaniards to the sword. This was scarcely resolved upon, when they commenced with every species of weapons, to massacre every man, and some flying from their merciless hands into the waves, a canoe was sent in pursuit of those who endeavoured to swim on shore. They next plundered the Spanish vessel, restored the English masters to their respective vessels, and set the Spaniard on fire. Lowe's next cruise was between the Leeward Islands and the mainland, where, in a continued course of prosperity, he successively captured no less than nineteen ships of different sizes, and in general treated their crews with a barbarity unequalled even among pirates. But it happened that the Greyhound, of twenty guns and one hundred and twenty men, was cruising upon that coast. Informed of the mischief these miscreants had done, the Greyhound went in search of them. Supposing they had discovered a prize, Lowe and his crew pursued them, and the Greyhound, allowing them to run after her until all things were ready to engage, turned upon the two sloops. One of these sloops was called the Fancy, and commanded by Lowe himself, and the other the Ranger, commanded by Harris. Both hoisted their piratical colours, and fired each a gun. When the Greyhound came within musket shot, she hauled up her mainsail, and clapped close upon a wind, to keep the pirates from running to leeward, and then engaged. But when the rogues found whom they had to deal with, they edged away under the man-of-war's stern, and the Greyhound standing after them, they made a running fight for about two hours. But little wind happening, the sloops gained from her, by the help of their oars, upon which the Greyhound left off firing, turned all hands to her own oars, and at three in the afternoon came up with them. The pirates hauled upon a wind to receive the man-of-war, and the fight was immediately renewed, with a brisk fire on both sides, till the ranger's mainyard was shot down. Under these circumstances, Lowe abandoned her to the enemy, and fled. The conduct of Lowe was surprising in this adventure, because his reputed courage and boldness had hitherto so possessed the minds of all people that he became a terror even to his own men. But his behaviour throughout this whole action showed him to be a base, cowardly villain, for had Lowe's sloop fought half so briskly as Harris's had done, as they were under a solemn oath to do, the man of war, in the opinion of some present, could never have hurt them. Nothing, however, could lessen the fury or reform the manners of that obdurate crew. Their narrow escape had no good effect upon them, and with redoubled violence they renewed their depredations and cruelties. The next vessel they captured was eighty miles from land. They used the master with the most wanton cruelty, then shot him dead, and forced the crew into the boat with a compass, a little water, and a few biscuits, and left them to the mercy of the waves. They, however, beyond all expectation, got safe to shore. Lowe proceeded in his villainous career with two fatal success. Unsatisfied with satiating their avarice, and walking the common path of wickedness, those inhuman wretches, like to Satan himself, made mischief their sport, cruelty their delight, and the ruin and murder of their fellow men their constant employment. Of all the piratical crews belonging to the English nation, none ever equaled Lowe in barbarity. Their mirth and their anger had the same effect. They murdered a man from good humour as well as from anger and passion. Their ferocious disposition seemed only to delight in cries, groans, and lamentations. One day, Lowe, having captured Captain Graves, a Virginia man, took a bowl of punch in his hand and said, "'Captain, here's half this to you.' The poor gentleman was too much touched with his misfortunes to be in a humour for drinking. He therefore modestly excused himself. Upon this, Low cocked and presented a pistol in the one hand, and his bowl in the other, saying, "'Either take the one or the other.'" Low next captured a vessel called the Christmas, mounted her with thirty-four guns, 
went on board her himself, assumed the title of admiral, and hoisted the black flag. His next prize was a brigantine, half manned with Portuguese and half with English. The former he hanged, and the latter he thrust into their boat and dismissed, while he set fire to the vessel. The success of Lowe was unequalled, as well as his cruelty, and during a long period he continued to pursue his wicked course with impunity. All wickedness comes to an end, and Lowe's crew at last rose against him, and he was thrown into a boat without provisions and abandoned to his fate. This was because Lowe murdered the quartermaster while he lay asleep. Not long after he was cast adrift, a French vessel happened along and took him into Martinico, and after a quick trial by the authorities, he received short shift on a gallows erected for his benefit. End of chapter 15「All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain」「Read by Morgan Saletta」「Life and Adventures of Captain Edward England » This adventurer was mate of a sloop that sailed from Jamaica, and was taken by Captain Winter, a pirate, just before the settlement of the pirates at Providence Island. After the pirates had surrendered to His Majesty's pardon, and Providence Island was peopled by the English government, Captain England sailed to Africa. There he took several vessels, particularly the Cadigan, from Bristol, commanded by one Skinner. When the latter struck to the pirate, he was ordered to come on board in his boat. The person upon whom he first cast his eye proved to be his old boatswain, who stared him in the face and accosted him in the following manner. Ah, Captain Skinner, is it you, the only person I wished to see? I am much in your debt, and I shall pay you in your own coin. The poor man trembled in every joint, and dreaded the event, as he well might. It happened that Skinner and his old boatswain, with some of his men, had quarrelled, so that he thought fit to remove them on board a man of war, while he refused to pay them their wages. Not long after, they found means to leave the man of war, and went on board a small ship in the West Indies. They were taken by a pirate, and brought to Providence, and from thence sailed as pirates with Captain England. Thus, accidentally meeting their old captain, they severely revenged the treatment they had received. After the rough salutation which has been related, the boatswain called to his comrades, laid hold of Skinner, tied him fast to the windlass, and pelted him with glass bottles until they cut him in a shocking manner, then whipped him about the deck until they were quite fatigued, remaining deaf to all his prayers and entreaties, and at last, in an insulting tone, observed that as he had been a good master to his men, he should have an easy death and upon this shot him through the head. Having taken such things out of the ship as they stood most in need of, she was given to Captain Davis in order to try his fortune with a few hands. Captain England, some time after, took a ship called the Pearl, for which he exchanged his own sloop, fitted her up for piratical service, and called her the Royal James. In that vessel he was very fortunate, and took several ships of different sizes and different nations. In the spring of 1719 the pirates returned to Africa, and beginning at the river Gambia, sailed down the coast to Cape Corso, and captured several vessels. Some of them they pillaged and allowed to proceed, some they fitted out for the pirate service, and others they burned. Leaving our pirate upon this coast, the Revenge and the Flying King, two other pirate vessels, sailed for the West Indies, where they took several prizes, and then cleared and sailed for Brazil. There they captured some Portuguese vessels, but a large Portuguese man-of-war coming up to them proved an unwelcome guest. The revenge escaped, but was soon lost upon that coast. The flying king in despair ran ashore. There were then seventy on board, twelve of whom were slain, and the remainder taken prisoners. The Portuguese hanged thirty-eight of them. Captain England, whilst cruising upon that coast, took the Peterborough of Bristol and the victory. The former they detained, the latter they plundered and dismissed. In the course of his voyage, England met with two ships, but these taking shelter under Cape Corsal Castle, he unsuccessfully attempted to set them on fire. He next sailed down to Widder Road, where Captain Labouche had been before England, and left him no spoil. He now went into the harbour, cleaned his own ship, and fitted the Peterborough, which he called the Victory. During several weeks the pirates remained in this quarter, indulging in every species of riot and debauchery until the natives, exasperated with their conduct, came to an open rupture, when several of the negroes were slain, and one of their towns set on fire by the pirates. Leaving that port, the pirates, when at sea, 
determined by vote to sail for the East Indies, and arrived at Madagascar. After watering and taking in some provisions, they sailed for the coast of Malabar. This place was situated in the Mogul Empire, and is one of its most beautiful and fertile districts. It extends from the coast of Canora to Cape Comorin. The original natives are Negroes, but a mingled race of Mahometans, who are generally merchants, have been introduced in modern times. Having sailed almost round the one half of the globe, literally seeking whom they might devour, our pirates arrived in this hitherto untried and prolific field for their operations. Not long after their settlement at Madagascar, they took a cruise, in which they captured two Indian vessels and a Dutchman. They exchanged the latter for one of their own, and directed their course again to Madagascar. Several of their hands were sent on shore with tents and ammunition, to kill such beasts and venison as the island afforded. They also formed the resolution to go in search of Avery's crew, which they knew had settled upon the island, but as their residence was upon the other side of the island, the loss of time and labor was the only fruit of their search. They tarried here but a very short time, then steered their course to Joanna, and coming out of that harbor, fell in with two English vessels and an Ostend ship, all Indiamen, which, after a most desperate action, they captured. The particulars of this extraordinary action are related in the following letter from Captain Macra. Bombay, November 16th, 1720. We arrived on the 25th of July last, in company with the Greenwich at Joanna, an isle not far from Madagascar. Putting in there to refresh our men, we found fourteen pirates who came in their canoes from the Mayota, where the pirate ship to which they belonged, viz. the Indian Queen, two hundred and fifty tons, twenty-eight guns, and ninety men, commanded by Captain Oliver de la Bouche, bound from the Guinea coast to the East Indies, had been bulged and lost. They said they left the captain and forty of their men building a new vessel, to proceed on their wicked designs. Captain Kirby and I, concluding that it might be of great service to the East India Company to destroy such a nest of rogues, were ready to sail for that purpose on the 17th of August, about eight o'clock in the morning, when we discovered two pirates standing into the Bay Joanna, one of thirty-four, and the other of thirty-six guns. I immediately went on board the Greenwich, where they seemed very diligent in preparation for an engagement, and I left Captain Kirby with mutual promises of standing by each other. I then unmoored, got under sail, and brought two boats ahead to row me close to the Greenwich, but he, being open to a valley and a breeze, made the best of his way from me, which an Ostender in our company, of twenty-two guns, seeing, did the same, though the captain had promised heartily to engage with us, and I believe would have been as good as his word if Captain Kirby had kept his. About half an hour after twelve, I called several times to the Greenwich to bear down to our assistance, and fired a shot at him, but to no purpose, for though we did not doubt but he would join us, because, when he got about a league from us, he brought his ship to and looked on, yet both he and the Ostender basely deser deserted us, and left us engaged with barbarous and inhuman enemies, with their black and bloody flags hanging over us, without the least appearance of ever escaping, but to be cut to pieces. But God in his good providence determined otherwise. For, notwithstanding their superiority, we engaged them both about three hours, during which time the biggest of them received some shot betwixt wind and water, which made her keep off a little to stop her leaks. The other endeavored all she could to board us, by rowing with her oars, being within half a ship's length of us about an hour. But by good fortune we shot all her oars to pieces, which prevented them, and by consequence saved our lives. About four o'clock most of the officers and men posted on the quarter-deck being killed and wounded, the largest ship making up to us with diligence, being still within a cable's length of us, often giving us a broadside, there being now no hopes of Captain Kirby's coming to our assistance, we endeavored to run ashore, and though we drew four feet of water more than the pirate, it pleased God that he stuck fast on a higher ground than, happily, we fell in with, so was disappointed a second time from boarding us. Here we had a more violent engagement than before. All my officers and most of my men behaved with unexpected courage, and, as we had a considerable advantage by having a broadside to his bow, we did him great damage, so that had Captain Kirby come in then, I believe we should have taken both the vessels, for we had one of them sure, but the other pirate, who was still firing at us, seeing the Greenwich did not offer to assist us, supplied his consort with three boats full of fresh men. About five in the evening the Greenwich stood clear away to sea, leaving us struggling hard for life in the very jaws of death, which the other pirate that was afloat seeing got a warp out, and was hauling under our stern. By this time, many of my men being killed and wounded, and no hopes left of us escaping being all murdered by enraged barbarous conquerors, I ordered all that could to get into the longboat, under the cover of the smoke of our guns, so that, with what some did in boats, 
and others by swimming, most of us that were able got ashore by seven o'clock. When the pirates came aboard, they cut three of our wounded men to pieces. I, with some of my people, made what haste I could to Kingstown, twenty-five miles from us, where I arrived next day, almost dead with the fatigue and loss of blood, having been sorely wounded in the head by a musket ball. At this town I heard that the pirates had offered ten thousand dollars to the country people to bring me in, which many of them would have accepted, only they knew the king and all his chief people were in my interest. Meanwhile, I caused a report to be spread that I was dead of my wounds, which much abated their fury. About ten days after, being pretty well recovered, and hoping the malice of our enemies was nigh over, I began to consider the dismal condition we were reduced to, being in a place where we had no hopes of getting a passage home, all of us in a manner naked, not having had time to bring with us either a shirt or a pair of shoes, except what we had on. Having obtained leave to go on board the pirates with the promise of safety, several of the chief of them knew me, and some of them had sailed with me, which I found to be of great advantage, because, notwithstanding their promise, some of them would have cut me to pieces, and all that would not enter with them had it not been for their chief captain, Edward England, and some others whom I knew. They talked of their burning one of our ships, which we had so entirely disabled as to be no farther use to them, and to fit the Cassandra in her room, but in the end I managed the affair so well that they made me a present of the said shattered ship, which was Dutch-built, and called the Fancy. Her burden was about three hundred tons. I procured also a hundred and twenty-nine bales of the company's cloth, though they would not give me a rag of my own clothes. They sailed the third of September, and I, with jury masts and such old sails as they left me, made a shift to do the like on the eighth, together with forty-three of my ship's crew, including two passengers and twelve soldiers, having no more than five tons of water aboard. After a passage of forty-eight days, I arrived here on the twenty-sixth of October, almost naked and starved, having been reduced to a pint of water a day, and almost in despair of ever seeing land, by reason of the calms we met with between the coast of Arabia and Malabar. We had in all thirteen men killed and twenty-four wounded, and we were told that we destroyed about ninety or a hundred of the pirates. When they left us, they were about three hundred whites and eighty black on both ships. I am persuaded, had our consort the Greenwich done his duty, we had destroyed both of them, and got two hundred thousand pounds for our owners and selves, whereas the loss of the Cassandra may justly be imputed to his deserting us. I have delivered all the bales that were given me into the company's warehouse, for which the governor and council have ordered me a reward. Our governor, Mr. Boone, who is extremely kind and civil to me, had ordered me home with the packet, but Captain Harvey, who had a prior promise, being home in with the fleet, goes in my room. The governor had promised me a country voyage to help to make up my losses, and would have me stay and accompany him to England next year. Captain Macra was certainly in imminent danger, in trusting himself and his men on board the pirate ship, and unquestionably nothing but the desperate circumstances in which he was placed could have justified so hazardous a step. The honor and influence of Captain England, however, protected him and his men from the fury of the crew, who would willingly have wreaked their vengeance upon them. It is pleasing to discover any instance of generosity or honor among such an abandoned race, who bid defiance to all the laws of honor, and, indeed, are regardless of all laws human and divine. Captain England was so steady to Captain Macra that he informed him it would be with no small difficulty in address that he would be able to preserve him and his men from the fury of the crew, who were greatly enraged at all the resistance which had been made. He likewise acquainted him that his influence and authority among them was giving place to that of Captain Taylor, chiefly because the dispositions of the latter were more savage and brutal. They therefore consulted between them what was the best method to secure the favor of Taylor and keep him in good humor. Macra made the punch to flow in great abundance and employed every artifice to soothe the mind of that ferocious villain. A single incident was also very favorable to the unfortunate captain. It happened that a pirate, with a prodigious pair of whiskers, a wooden leg, and stuck round with pistols, came blustering and swearing upon the quarter-deck, inquiring, Where is Captain Macra? He naturally supposed that this barbarous-looking fellow would be his executioner, but, as he approached, he took the captain by the hand, swearing that he was an honest fellow, and that he had formerly sailed with him, and would stand by him, and let him see the man that would touch him. This terminated the dispute, and Captain Taylor's disposition was so ameliorated with punch, that he consented that the old pirate ship, and so many bales of cloth, should be given to Macra, and then sank into the arms of intoxication. England now pressed Macra to hasten away, lest the ruffian, upon his becoming sober, should not only retract his word, but give liberty to the crew to cut him and his men to pieces. But the gentler temper of Captain England, and his generosity toward the unfortunate Macra, 
proved the organ of much calamity to himself, the crew, in general, deeming the kind of usage which Macra had received inconsistent with piratical policy, they circulated a report that he was coming against them with the company's force. The result of these invidious reports was to deprive England of his command and to excite these cruel villains to put him on shore, with three others, upon the island of Mauritius. If England and his small company had not been destitute of every necessary, they might have made a comfortable subsistence here, as the islands abound with deer, hogs, and other animals. Dissatisfied, however, with their solitary situation, Captain England and his three men exerted their industry and ingenuity, and formed a small boat, with which they sailed to Madagascar, where they subsisted upon the generosity of some more fortunate piratical companions. Captain Taylor detained some of the officers and men belonging to Captain Macra, and having repaired their vessel, sailed for India. The day before they made land, they espied two ships to the eastward, and supposing them to be English, Captain Taylor ordered one of the officers of Macra's ship to communicate to him the private signals between the company's ships, swearing that if he did not do so immediately, he would cut him into pound pieces. But the poor man, being unable to give the information demanded, was under the necessity of enduring their threats. Arrived at the vessels, they found that they were two Moorish ships, laden with horses. The pirates brought the captains and merchants on board, and tortured them in a barbarous manner, to constrain them to tell where they had hid their treasure. They were, however, disappointed, and the next morning they discovered land, and at the same time a fleet on shore plying to windward. In this situation they were at a considerable loss how to dispose of their prizes. To let them go would lead to their discovery, and thus defeat the design of their voyage and it was a distressing matter to sink the men and the horses, though many of them were for adopting that measure. They, however, brought them to anchor, threw all the sails overboard, and cut one of the masts half through. While they lay at anchor, and were employed in taking in water, one of the above-mentioned fleet moved toward them with English colors, and was answered by the pirate with a red ensign, but they did not hail each other. At night they left the musket ships, and sailed after the fleet. About four next morning the pirates were in the midst of the fleet, but seeing their vast superiority, were greatly at a loss what method to adopt. The victory had become leaky, and their hands were so few in number that it only remained for them to deceive, if possible, the English squadron. They were unsuccessful in gaining anything out of that fleet, and had only the wretched satisfaction of burning a single galley. They, however, that day seized a galliot laden with cotton, and made inquiry of the men concerning the fleet. They protested that they had not seen a ship since they left Gogo, and earnestly implored their mercy but instead of treating them with lenity, they put them to the rack in order to extort farther confession. The following day, a fresh easterly wind blew hard and rent the galliot's sails. Upon this, the pirates put her company into a boat with nothing but a trysail, no provisions, and only four gallons of water, and, though they were out of sight of land, left them to shift for themselves. It may be proper to inform our readers that one Angria, an Indian prince of considerable territory and strength, had proved a troublesome enemy to Europeans, and particularly to the English. Calaba was his principal fort, situated not many leagues from Bombay, and he possessed an island in sight of the port, from whence he molested the company's ships. His art in bribing the ministers of the great Mogul, and the shallowness of the water that prevented large ships of war from approaching, were the principal causes of his safety. The Bombay fleet, consisting of four grabs, the London and the Candwa, and two other ships, with a galliot, having an additional thousand men on board for this enterprise, sailed to attack a fort belonging to Angria upon the Malabar coast. Though their strength was great, yet they were totally unsuccessful in their enterprise. It was this fleet returning home that our pirates discovered upon the present occasion. Upon the sight of the pirates, the commodore of the fleet intimated to Mr. Brown, the general, that as they had no orders to fight, and had gone upon a different purpose, it would be improper for them to engage. Informed of the loss of this favorable opportunity of destroying the robbers, the governor of Bombay was highly enraged, and giving the command of the fleet to Captain Macra, ordered him to pursue and engage them wherever they should be found. The pirates, having barbarously sent away the galliot with her men, they arrived southward, and between Goa and Karwar they heard several guns, so that they came to anchor and sent their boat to reconnoiter, which returned next morning with the intelligence of two grabs lying at anchor in the road. They accordingly weighed, ran toward the bay, and in the morning were discovered by the grabs, who had just time to run under India Diva Castle for protection. This was the more vexatious to the pirates, as they were without water, some of them, therefore, were for making a descent upon the island. 
but that measure not being generally approved, they sailed toward the south and took a small ship, which had only a Dutchman and two Portuguese on board. They sent one of these on shore to the captain to inform him that, if he would give them some water and fresh provisions, he might have his vessel returned. He replied that, if they would give him possession over the bar, he would comply with their request. But, suspecting the integrity of his design, they sailed for Lacadiva Islands, uttering dreadful imprecations against the captain. Disappointed in finding water at these islands, they sailed to Melinda Island and sent their boats on shore to discover if there was any water, or if there were any inhabitants. They returned with the information that there was an abundance of water, that the houses were only inhabited by women and children, the men having fled at the appearance of the ships. They accordingly hastened to supply themselves with water, used the defenseless women in a brutal manner, destroyed many of their fruit trees, and set some of their houses on fire. While off the island, they lost several of their anchors by the rockiness of the ground, and one day, blowing more violently than usual, they were forced to take to sea, leaving several people in most of the water casks, but when the gale was over, they returned to take in their men and water. Their provisions being nearly exhausted, they resolved to visit the Dutch at Cochin. After sailing three days, they arrived off Telesheri, and took a small vessel belonging to Governor Adams, and brought the master on board, very much intoxicated, who informed them of the expedition of Captain Macra. This intelligence raised their utmost indignation. A villain, said they, to whom we have given a ship in presence to come against us. He ought to be hanged, and since we cannot show our resentment to him, let us hang the dogs his people, who wish him well, and would do the same if they were clear. If it be in my power, said the quartermaster, both masters and officers of ships shall be carried with us for the future, only to plague them. Now, England, we mark him for this. They proceeded to Calicut, and attempting to cut out a ship, were prevented by some guns placed upon the shore. One of Captain Macra's officers was under deck at this time, and was commanded both by the captain and the quartermaster to tend the braces on the booms, in hopes that a shot would take him before they got clear. He was about to have excused himself, but they threatened to shoot him and when he expostulated and claimed their promise to put him on shore, he received an unmerciful beating from the quartermaster, Captain Taylor, to whom that duty belonged, being lame in his hands. The next day following, they met a Dutch galliot, laden with limestone, bound for Calicut, on board of which they put one Captain Fox, and some of the crew interceding for Macra's officer, Taylor and his party replied, If we let this dog go, who has overheard our designs and resolutions, he will overset all our well-advised resolutions, and particularly the supply we are seeking for at the hands of the Dutch. When they arrived at Cochin, they sent a letter on shore by a fishing boat, entered the road and anchored, each ship saluting the fort with eleven guns, and receiving the same number in return. This was the token of their welcome reception, and at night a large boat was sent, deeply laden with liquors and all kinds of provisions, and in it a servant of John Trumpet, one of their friends, to inform them that it would be necessary for them to run further south, where they would be supplied both with provisions and naval stores. They had scarcely anchored at the appointed place when several canoes with white and black inhabitants came on board, and continued without interruption to perform all the good offices in their power during their stay in that place. In particular, John Trumpet brought a large boat of arrack and sixty bales of sugar, as a present from the governor and his daughter, the former receiving in return a table clock and the other a gold watch, the spoil of Captain Macra's vessel. When their provisions were all on board, Trumpet was rewarded with about six or seven thousand pounds, was saluted with three cheers and eleven guns, and several hands full of silver were thrown into the boat for the men to gather at pleasure. There being little wind that night, they remained at anchor, and in the morning were surprised with the return of Trumpet, bringing another boat equally well stored with provisions, with chests of peace goods and ready-made clothes, and along with him the fiscal of the place. At noon they espied a sail toward the south, and immediately gave chase but she outsailed them, and sheltered under the fort of Cochin. Informed that they would not be molested in taking her from under the castle, they sailed towards her, but upon the fort firing two guns, they ran off, for fear of more serious altercation, and returning, anchored in their former station. They were too welcome visitants to be permitted to depart, so long as John Trumpet could contrive to detain them. With this view he informed them that in a few days a rich vessel, commanded by the governor of Bombay's brother, was to pass that way. That government is certainly in a wretched state which is under the necessity of trading with pirates in order to enrich itself. Nor will such a government hesitate by what means an injury can be repaired, or a fortune gained. Neither can language describe the low and base principles of a government which could employ such a miscreant as John Trumpet in its service. He was a tool in the hands of the government of Cochin, and, as the dog said in the fable, 
what is done by the master's orders is the master's action, or, as the same sentiment is perhaps better expressed in the legal axiom, qui facet per alium facet per se. While under the direction of Trumpet, some proposed to proceed directly to Madagascar, but others were disposed to wait until they should be provided with a store ship. The majority being of the latter opinion, they steered to the south, and seeing a ship on shore were desirous to get near her. But the wind preventing, they separated, the one sailing northward and the other southward, in hopes of securing her when she should come out, whatever direction she might take. They were now, however, almost entrapped in the snare laid for them. In the morning, to their astonishment and consternation, instead of being called to give chase, five large ships were near, which made a signal for the pirates to bear down. The pirates were in the greatest dread, lest it should be Captain Macra, of whose activity and courage they had formerly sufficient proof. The pirate ships, however, joined and fled with all speed from the fleet. In three hours' chase, none of the fleet gained upon them, except one grab. The remainder of the day was calm, and, to their great consolation, the next day this dreaded fleet was entirely out of sight. Their alarm being over, they resolved to spend the Christmas in feasting and mirth in order to drown care and to banish thought. Nor did one day suffice, but they continued their reveling for several days, and made so free with their fresh provisions, that in their next cruise they were put upon short allowance, and it was entirely owing to the sugar and other provisions that were in the leaky ship, that they were preserved from absolute starvation. In this condition, they reached the island of Mauritius, refitted the victory, and left that place with the following inscription written upon one of the walls, left this place on the 5th of April, to go to Madagascar for Limos. This they did, lest any visit should be paid to the place during their absence. They, however, did not sail directly from Madagascar, but the island of Muscarius, where they fortunately fell in with the Portuguese of seventy guns, lying at anchor. The greater part of her guns had been thrown overboard, her masts lost, and the whole vessel disabled by a storm. She therefore became an easy prey to the pirates. Conde de Ericera, viceroy of Goa, who went upon the fruitless expedition against Angria the Indian, and several passengers, were on board. Besides other valuable articles in specie, they found in her diamonds to the amount of four millions of dollars. Supposing that the ship was an Englishman, the viceroy came on board next morning, was made prisoner, and obliged to pay two thousand dollars as a ransom for himself and the other prisoners. After this he was sent ashore, with an express engagement to leave a ship to convey him and his companions to another port. Meanwhile, the pirates received intelligence that a vessel was to the leeward of the island, which they pursued and captured. But instead of performing their promise to the viceroy, which they could easily have done, they sent the Ostender along with some of their men to Madagascar, to inform their friends of their success, with instructions to prepare masts for the prize, and they soon followed, carrying two thousand negroes in the Portuguese vessel. Madagascar is an island larger than Great Britain, situated upon the eastern coast of Africa, abounding with all sorts of provisions such as oxen, goats, sheep, poultry, fish, citrons, oranges, tamarinds, dates, cocoa nuts, bananas, wax, honey, rice, cotton, indigo, and all other fruits common in that quarter of the globe, ebony of which lances are made, gums of several kinds, and many other valuable productions. Here, in St. Augustine's Bay, the ships sometimes stop to take in water, when they make the inner passage to India and do not intend to stop at Joanna. The pirates now divided their plunder, receiving forty-two diamonds per man, or in smaller proportion according to their magnitude. A foolish, jocular fellow, who had received a large diamond of the value of forty-two, was highly displeased, and so went and broke it in pieces, exclaiming that he had many more shares than either of them. Some, contended with their treasure, and unwilling to run the risk of losing what they possessed, and perhaps their lives also, resolved to remain with their friends at Madagascar, under the stipulation that the longest livers should enjoy all the booty. The number of adventurers now being lessened, they burned the viceroy, cleaned the Cassandra, and the remainder went on board her under the command of Taylor, whom we must leave for a little while, in order to give an account of the squadron which arrived in India in 1721. When the Commodore arrived at the Cape, he received a letter that had been written by the governor of Pondicherry to the governor of Madras, informing him that the pirates were strong in the Indian seas, that they had eleven sail and fifteen hundred men, but adding that many of them retired about that time to Brazil and Guinea, while others fortified themselves at Madagascar, Mauritius, Joanna, and Mahilla, and that a crew under the command of Condon, in a ship called the Dragon, had captured a vessel with thirteen lakhs of rupees on board, and, having divided their plunder, had taken up their residence with their friends at Madagascar. Upon receiving this intelligence, Commodore Matthews sailed for these islands as the most probable place of success. 
he endeavored to prevail on England at St. Mary's to communicate to him what information he could give respecting the pirates, but England declined, thinking that this would be almost to surrender at discretion. He then took up the guns of the Jubilee sloop that were on board, and the men of war made several cruises in search of the pirates, but to no purpose. The squadron was then sent down to Bombay, was saluted by the fort, and after these exploits returned home. The pirate Captain Taylor, in the Cassandra, now fitted up the Portuguese man-of-war, and resolved upon another voyage to the Indies, but, informed that four men-of-war had been sent after the pirates in that quarter, he changed his determination and sailed for Africa. Arrived there, they put in a place near the Spirito Sancto, on the coast of Mano Matapa. As there was no correspondence by land, nor any trade carried on by sea to this place, they thought that it would afford a safe retreat. To their astonishment, however, when they approached the shore, it being in the dusk of the evening, they were accosted by several shot. They immediately anchored, and in the morning saw that the shot had come from a small fort of six guns, which they attacked and destroyed. This small fort was erected by the Dutch East India Company a few weeks before, and committed to the care of a hundred and fifty men, the one half of whom had perished by sickness or other causes. Upon their petition, sixteen of these were admitted into the society of the pirates, and the rest would have also been received had they not been Dutchmen, to whom they had a rooted aversion. In this place they continued during four months refitting their vessels, and amusing themselves with all manner of diversions, until the scarcity of their provisions awakened them to industry and exertion. They, however, left several parcels of goods to the starving Dutchmen, which mine here joyfully exchanged for provisions with the next vessel that touched at that fort. Leaving that place, they were divided in opinion what course to steer. Some went on board the Portuguese prize, and, sailing for Madagascar, abandoned the pirate life, and others going on board the Cassandra, sailed for the Spanish West Indies. The mermaid man of war, returning from a convoy, got near the pirates, and would have attacked them, but a consultation being held, it was deemed inexpedient, and thus the pirates escaped. A sloop was, however, dispatched to Jamaica with the intelligence, and the Lancaster was sent after them. But they were some days too late, the pirates having, with all their riches, surrendered to the governor of Portobello. End of chapter 16. Read by Morgan Saletta.